Once again, to Conceived in Liberty, the Bradley Speaker Series. I'm Rick Graber, president of the Bradley Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us. Certainly one of the most vigorous debates in our country uh, right now and, and for a long time has been the size and role of government. And as you can imagine, that uh, conversation is even more intense with the backdrop of a global pandemic and being in the midst of a US presidential election. But it's really far from the first time that government leaders have had to grapple with the topic of the proper scope of government. With me to explore this issue further is noted British historian and scholar, Andrew Roberts. Andrew's the author of numerous award-winning books on world leaders and military history. His most recent book entitled Churchill, Walking with Destiny, won both the ICS Churchill Award for Literacy and the Council on Foreign Relations Arthur Ross Prize. I just finished the book and it's terrific and I urge everyone to pick up a copy. It's just a tremendous read. Andrew, of course, is also a 2016 winner of the Bradley Prize. Welcome, Andrew, and greetings from the other side of the ocean. Thank you very much indeed, Rick, and thank you very much for those kind words about my book. Pleasure. So many questions about Winston Churchill and so little time, so let's just jump right in. Certainly one of Churchill's legacies was his advocacy of the free market system. So it's really kind of surprising that earlier in his career, we could call him a status, even supporting things such as the nationalization of railroads. What brought about the change? Um, luckily, he, uh, he saw the light, really. <laughs> um, yeah. he, you're quite right, started off, uh, of course, as one of the founders of the welfare state, um, in Britain, and also a, um, a supporter of the nationalization of the railways in 1919, immediately after the Great War. One has to remember, of course, that um, the grinding poverty in Edwardian Britain was such that they did need some kind of safety net at the very bottom to, uh, to save people. And he never expected the socialists to take over the concepts of the welfare state and make it so much more. Um, extensive. But the thing that really um, made him for, move from a statist to a free marketeer was reading uh, Friedrich von Hayek. He oh. read Road, of, uh, Road to Serfdom in 1944 when it was published, and he took on its arguments and he, and he believed them. And uh, so after the Second World War, he was very keen to dismantle the enormous state apparat apparatus that had been set up in that conflict. But certainly he believed that government expansion was appropriate in times of extreme circumstances or crisis, and World War II certainly qualifies as an extreme circumstance. Uh, how would he view the current pandemic? Is that an extreme circumstance? Well, he, he knew all about pandemics, of course, himself. He'd lived yes. the Russian flu, um, which had killed a million people in Western Europe uh, when he was 16. Uh, he lived through the terrible uh, Spanish flu, of course, when he was um, the minister for war and, uh, and he was demobilizing uh, large numbers of, of troops. And of course that was to kill over 50 million people worldwide. Uh, his family got, uh, got, all of them got influenza, um, but thankfully he survived. He, uh, so, so this wouldn't have come as a, a shock or a surprise to him. Um, I think perhaps the, uh, the best, our answer is that he saw fighting pandemics rather like fighting wars. He did believe um, that they were um, they, that disease in general had to be struggled against with uh, with all of the might of uh, both private enterprise and the state. I, I took from your book that uh, he truly enjoyed being the leader during what was the crisis of World War II. Do you think he would have enjoyed as much? Uh, this period of time and, and dealing with this pandemic? No, no, I don't think he would have at all. Um, he was um, uh, he was somebody who was uh, who was invigorated by struggle. Um, but uh, nonetheless, this is against an invisible enemy, obviously an enemy that doesn't have an intelligence service, um, one that you can um, 
lose people to, but you can't obviously gain positions uh, in a way that would have been uh, just as soul destroying for him as it has been for all of the rest of the uh, world leaders. Churchill was known for cultivating what he called the special relationship between the United States and Great Britain. He had many visits to the United States. It's clear from your book that he had some frustrations with American leadership and particularly President Roosevelt. But nonetheless, what would he think about America today? Does that special relationship still exist? Oh, he yes, he believed that the special relationship was uh, a really long-term um central really to the values of uh, what he called the English speaking peoples. And in his great speech of the, uh, at Harvard in September 1943, when he termed the phrase special relationship, he made it clear that this was not just a, um, a wartime measure. This was something for, uh, for the future for both countries. Um, and so I think he would look to your president, uh, uh, President Trump, and his obvious friendship with um, my prime minister, Boris Johnson, and uh, conclude that there is a connection that still works. It's important in trade, of course, but it's also important in uh, intelligence services and the nuclear um, cooperation between our countries. And we're on the same side so many times in uh, the struggles, the great struggles for civilization. So, yes, I think he would uh, he'd appreciate that it's still going. Talk a little bit about the, the Churchill legacy today. I've, we've all read some disturbing news in recent days about defacing of Churchill's statue. Um, what, what's going on there? Um, oh, yeah, I, it's, it's monstrous, really. It is truly appalling what's been going on here over the last uh, a few days, where um, his statue in Parliament Square, in the middle of London, in broad daylight, in front of policemen, was um, was spray painted. Um, the cenotaph, our our memorial to the dead of World War One and World War Two, uh, was also vandalised, um, and they had to be boxed up, um, which uh, which is a, a terrible uh, indictment, really, on the cultural malaise that has right. taken place in um, in my country. Um, the fact is that. Um, Black Lives Matter attacked the statue because he believed in a racial hierarchy, um, something that we, of course, know today to be uh, uh, absurd and obscene. But at the time that he was born, Charles Darwin was still alive. In fact, he was still alive when Churchill was at school. People believed that it was a scientific fact that these um, these terrible um, things today that we that we uh, would completely um, uh, loathe. Nonetheless, if you think yes. it's a big fact, then it's not right to uh, destroy and attack and, and vandalise a, uh, a memorial to somebody who was just believing what the majority of people believed at the time. Back to your book. Uh, the, the royal family gave you permission to read notes from King George VI after his weekly meetings with Churchill. No other biographer, to my knowledge, has had that kind of access that, that you had there. What did you learn from the King's notes that you didn't know before about Churchill? Yes, I was very lucky that uh, Her Majesty the Queen allowed me to be the first Churchill biographer to use um, the uh, diaries, King George VI diaries. And as you say, he noted down everything that uh, Winston Churchill said um, at the Tuesday audiences that he had every lunchtime. And what this taught me, um, and I was very fortunate, as I say, to, to have access to this because it allows us to know what was going through Churchill's mind all the way through the Second World War. And one of the things that's most interesting to me was how, um, how frustrated and, uh, and uh, irritated he was, really, with the Roosevelt administration for not moving closer towards bellicosity during the Second World War. He saw that war... Uh, against Hitler as a struggle um, for um, peace and democracy and civilization on one side and the most evil regime in human history on the other. And he couldn't understand why America was taking so long to get involved in it. I mean, he could, of course, understand it intellectually and politically, but he, he couldn't understand it in a more sort of visceral and emotional sense. And uh, so I think that was one of the uh, one of the most interesting aspects of those of this extraordinary new source. 
Churchill said that the, the choice is between two ways of life, individual liberty and state domin domination. Do you think it's surprising that all these decades later and long after the fall of the Soviet Union, the choice that he referred to is still a topic of conversation? I do. Yes, absolutely. We assumed, we uh, had every right to assume, I think, with the collapse of uh, the um, Nazis, of course, in 1945, but also Soviet communism in 1989, um, that that terrible dichotomy no longer needed to be uh, struggled with, maybe in China and the Chinese Communist Party, absolutely, uh, where that continued to survive. But, um, but freedom seemed to be on the up. Uh, thanks to um, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, amongst uh, amongst others. Um, and it's hugely depressing, really, isn't it, uh, 30 years later, to think we still have to fight these same arguments again and again. My sense is that um, part of the, um, the responsibility for that is uh, academia. Um, some people in the media as well, uh, several people really in key places in, uh, in public, um, part, public places in uh, both Britain and America simply didn't, don't seem to have got point of the 1980s at all. Final related question. Churchill also warned that measures to increase government's power should be temporary, saying that control for control's sake is senseless. Nevertheless, following World War II, the UK's labor government seemed to greatly increase socialist policies. Uh, and that, that's a topic that uh, has certainly been discussed here in the United States in recent days. Uh, what, what can the U.S. learn from that process? And uh, give us your insights from a, a clearly a different perspective. Oh, well, I think the United States can learn an enormous amount. Um, I was very fortunate to be appointed by Margaret Thatcher to take her place on the Margaret Thatcher Archive Trust. And I knew her well and uh, admired her uh, enormously. And I think the things that she stood for and the things that she said are just as relevant today as ever they were in the 1970s and, and 1980s. And, uh, and we forget at our peril how important free enterprises and free markets for the rest of freedoms. I don't think you can have political freedoms unless you have the uh, underpinning of, uh, of economic freedom. And that's something that she said again and again it's been proved right at the time that she said it, and it's proved right all the time ever since. Andrew Roberts, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate your insights. It's always fascinating to have conversations with you. Next time on Conceived in Liberty, we'll be joined by longtime Bradley Foundation board member and scholar, Robbie George. We hope you'll join us then. Thanks again.